Well, hey guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, where I'm going to show you what it takes to change this pile of soft maple boards into a stack of custom design, custom profile, custom milled nickel gap planks for an upcoming remodel project that I'm doing for a discerning client. Because of time constraints, I'm going to produce this video in my Next Level Carpentry rough cut format so that I can focus on showing you how to make custom nickel gap panels rather than all the distractions of producing a full feature, full format video. And so to start the process of turning these planks into paneling, I've got all the rough sawn pieces stacked up on the work table here so that I can tackle the first step of a project like this, which is selecting which pieces get cut to which rough size to begin the milling process. And as I start that, I'll explain that there's a ton of nickel gap options out there on the market, ranging from really bad to mediocre to actually pretty decent. And it's available in various materials, pine, MDF, etc. But in working with my client and her designer, we decided to take this little job in a different direction because none of the standard profiles and the standard materials were going to be acceptable. And to achieve the ultimate design that we decided on, I'm starting with this soft maple material. This is random width, hit and miss. And it's in fairly rough shape, but that's fine because out of this stack, I need to get 26 pieces that are five and a quarter inches wide, a little over five feet long, and they'll end up at five eighths of an inch thick. So I can mill away all the excess material here to come up with blanks to make the paneling that I need to end up with. And there's a reality in the custom milling process that if you buy boards that are already plain to thickness and cut to width, it was just somebody else that cut away the excess material and turning it into firewood kindling and shavings which just highlights the reality of doing custom mill work. You end up being the person that sees and realizes how much waste material there is for any finished product you see on the shelf in a store. But with all that said, I begin by quickly going through this stack, assessing which pieces are going to end up as paneling, which pieces are going to end up as cutoffs, and then cutting the pieces to rough length. And because the only pieces of soft maple available at my local supplier are thicker and longer than I really need for this job, this initial selection process is pretty quick and easy because there's plenty of extra length and thickness available for milling out perfect pieces for the finished paneling. And because the random width of some of the wider pieces is pretty tight for getting two finished pieces at five and a quarter inches wide, I pre-cut longer pieces down into shorter ones so that I can maintain the finished width I need after the process of straightening edges and ripping the pieces to rough. With. I quickly assess each piece for final yield and then measure off a rough length at about five foot three inches, which leaves a sizable offcut from the end of each of these 12 foot planks. Because these pieces are only cut to rough length at this stage, I just eyeball my cuts per square and lop the boards into pieces with a little cordless circular saw. And that is pretty much what the initial selection and rough sizing process looks like for every millwork project I do. This job is a little less demanding because this stuff will get painted in the end, so I'm really not worried so much about uh, grain match issues as I might be on some projects, and I don't need any long scrap. A piece like this will yield two five and a quarter or five and a half inch blanks plus a rip, so the scrap that comes off this will be limited to that five foot three inch length on a project where maybe I'm doing some base molding or something, I might try to rough size a piece like this in its full 12 foot length. So I had a, an off cut that was 12 feet long to use for a long piece of trim. But as I said, I don't have any need for full length off cuts on this job. I'll use some of the off cuts on this for this project, but they don't need to be any longer than the five foot three inch rough length. In the modestly sized next level carpentry shop, I've got to do a little bit of reconfiguring to get set up for the next step, which is to use the joiner to quickly straighten the best edge on each of these rough sized planks. Because I need the next level carpentry shop to be versatile, all the equipment is on wheels and my dust collection consists of flex hose that I can adapt to any equipment configuration that I need to work quickly and efficiently in the shop. And the configuration I use for this step places the joiner near the end of my rolling work table work surface where I've stacked all the roughs on planks with an easy reach so I can grab a plank, straighten an edge, and restack it with all the straightened edges oriented the same direction. And once the configuration is complete, I fire out my Gyro Air G700 dust processor and set about straightening those edges. 
Once the straightening process is complete and every plank on the saw top has a perfectly straight edge oriented to my right as I face the saw, I do another minor reset of equipment so that I can perform the next step, which is to rip each one of these blanks to a rough width of 5 and 3 eighths or greater so that they're more consistent in width for future steps. And for some viewers, this might be the first opportunity to see how my exclusive Groat Tangent Ramp Outfeed Roller Stands work in action in the shop on a real world project. And viewers also get a chance to see how my somewhat awkward but very versatile flex duct system works to provide hookups for dust collection each time the shop gets reconfigured for the next step in the process. And if you ever have need for any of the wide range of dust collection hoses or fittings that you see at use here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop, just reach out to my friends at Air Handling Systems where their team is ready to get you fixed up with a wide range of standard fittings and an infinite range of custom fittings, no matter what your dust collection needs happen to be. As I near the end of the rough ripping process, you can see that some of the boards are more than twice as wide as the five and a half inch strips I'm cutting. So I first trim off the uneven edge from the second half of the piece so that I end up with a five and a half inch strip and a clean off cut that I can make use of later in the process. Once I finish the rough ripping process, I sort through the off cuts to sort out useful pieces from the S crap so I can set the useful pieces aside and cut up the S crap into short pieces at the miter saw to keep off cut clutter to a minimum and keep the shop environment organized for safety. Because I'm working with random width rough stock, when I'm done rough ripping these blanks to width, I've got different classifications here. These two piles are the best. They're five and a half inches wide. That gives me plenty of room to clean them up to get them down to the five and a quarter inch finish width. Uh, this pile are narrows. These are five and three eighths. Uh, they're still straight and they'll clean up to five and a quarter nicely, but I've got to be a little more careful as I go through the milling process. This pile here is kind of the culls of this process because some of the double width boards weren't wide enough to get two full strips out of. So I could get a five and three eighths and then a skinnier piece out of it. And so with these pieces, I'll end up gluing on one of these useful off cuts to a good grain match and glue that on. And once the glue's dried, I can rip it down into this five and a half inch rough stock width. I do that on a couple of these. You can see there's some wane here that interrupts with the five and a half inch width, so I have to cut that off and glue a piece on to get those pieces straightened out. And then, because of the nature of the material I bought, uh, this visible defect here fits within the specifications, and so this piece I'll need to rip that bad spot out of the middle, essentially, and glue one of the wider useful offcuts on there to get the five and a half inch blank I need. And that's why I kind of conserve as I'm going through the process to end up with these pieces in case I need that material to augment some of these to get all the blanks that I need that are wide enough to mill down and then clean up at that five and a quarter inch width. In a perfect world, I'd be able to buy blanks that were already five and a half inches wide so that I could start at this stage. And depending on the material you're using, you can buy one by six material at a big box store. It's five and a half inches wide and it could be brought in to the milling process at this stage and then just pick up from here with the next steps in the process. But I wanted to show viewers what this looks like starting out in the beginning with that full pallet of wood because many hardwood suppliers, that's what you buy and you either pay them to do some pre-milling to get it to this stage or you bring it into the shop and you do that milling yourself. But either way, that percentage of waste always exists. Whether you see it or not, it exists out there somewhere. If you go to the hardwood supplier, there's stacks and stacks of little offcut strips like the S-crap I cut up and put in that bin. And there's dumpsters full of hamster shavings that get generated as this material gets milled down to the final 5 eighths of an inch thickness. In the process, I'll start next. Once I have all the blanks straightened and ripped to rough width, I use a sharp six inch putty knife to scrape the surface and dislodge any sand or grit that's in there. Get them cleaned up so that it doesn't nick the knives on my planer. And although this is kind of a monotonous step, it really does help preserve the life of the cutters on my joiner and my thickness planer. And that goes a long way for producing next level quality moldings in a small shop. 
And once I've gone down through a stack of boards with a putty knife and have them all cleaned up, I take a carpenter's pencil and put squiggle marks on both faces of every piece. And this quick, simple step helps me keep track of what milling has been done on which face of which piece. And it also helps me see with a visual indicator when the whole face has been uh, planed smooth and clean. And that's especially helpful on boards that are humpy or wavy. Because as soon as the pencil mark is gone, I know the board is flat and smooth and I don't have to do a close inspection to make sure the boards are ready for the next milling step. Once all the blanks are scraped clean and marked, I'm ready to flatten one face on the joiner, which is the next step in the next level milling process. Now because this wood is almost 15 16 of an inch thick and I have to end up at 5 8 of an inch, I can take a pretty heavy first pass on this to clean them up the pieces and to make sure they're flat. But if I was starting off with 1 by 6 is from a big box store that were only 3 quarters of an inch or a skinny 3 quarters of an inch, I'd have to be more conservative on the first pass to make sure they didn't end up too thin for the final 5 8 inch of an inch, 5 8 of an inch thickness that I'm after. But the process is to take a quick look at the piece, see where the hooks and cups and bows are, set the planer depth accordingly, and make one or two passes to clean up one face of the piece. And then each piece gets stacked over here on the other side of the work surface to stage them for the thickness planing process that comes next. Because no two blanks are the same, you'll see me vary my adjustments and the number of passes from board to board so that I get one face clean and flat, removing a minimum of material and making sure that there's enough material remaining so that each of the blanks will clean up to exactly 5 eighths of an inch in the thickness planing step next. And this systematic process of milling rough sawn lumber into blanks of a consistent thickness is pretty much routine. And I'm including these clips here so that you get an overview of the milling process so that you can use it for making your own nickel gap paneling or use the same process to prep for different types of moldings like casing, base, or even crown molding. Because of the excessive amount of material being removed in these planing steps, I frequently check and empty the bins in the dust processor to optimize dust collection and preventing the dust processor from going into the automatic shutdown cycle if the bins overfill. And if anyone watching this video has a hamster farm and is in need of bushels and bushels of shavings, just dial 1-800-NEXT-LEVEL-CARPENTRY and we can talk about getting these mountains of clean maple shavings from me to you. Go ahead and call me Mr. Obvious while I explain that these blanks are all prepped. They have squiggle marks on one side, no squiggle marks on the other because they're flat on one face. And because the boards uh, tend to have a little bit of a crown to them, most of these boards have a hump in them. You can kind of see that by the way they rock. And you might be able to see it in this shot if the camera focuses. This board is uh, a skinny three quarters on each end and then almost 15 sixteenths, probably seven eighths in the middle. But everything is oriented here. As you can see, I did a reset of the shop so that I can easily take these boards and slide them through the thickness planer. And you'll see as I go through the process that naturally the first thing to get planed off is the middle where the boards have a hump in them. And it'll take quite a few passes to get from the setting I have here, which is about seven eighths of an inch, all the way down to five eighths of an inch. And this is certainly the loudest and probably the most monotonous phase of milling these blanks. But it's also a necessary phase and it goes a lot quicker when I'm working and not talking. Thickness planing these blanks is another great example of how useful a groat outfeed roller stand can be because each of these 26 blanks takes multiple passes. That roller stand effortlessly supports hundreds of boards by the time I'm done with this step. After three passes of about 1 32nd of an inch each on all of these blanks, half the stack is all cleaned up on both faces and coincidentally the other half of the stack still need some planing before the faces are all cleaned up. And you can see that by the squiggle marks here. On this piece, there's squiggle marks on each end. That means the piece had a hump in the middle and it's thin on the ends. And each piece has a little bit different pattern on there. This one's thin on the end, had a thin spot over here. And this is probably the best example of all. Uh, thin on one end and there's kind of a blank spot and a thin spot on the end. And that just reflects the condition of the board uh, before I went into this 
uh, flattening and planing process. So I'll keep after it, going a 32nd of an inch at a time until all of these faces are cleaned up. And on this stack, where both faces are already clean, I've gone through the pile and flipped pieces, and I'll keep planing off the B face, even if that's the face that I ran over the joiner. But in this case, there's stains here, so I'll keep planing on that. And it's kind of a finer point because in this case, all this wood gets painted. So if there's a blemish, it doesn't really matter. It gets painted over. But when the millwork is going to get stained, you can have a good face and a bad face. And if you plane long enough on the, uh, the good face, you'll end up with two bad faces. So I hope, hope that makes sense. It's kind of a little technical thing, but I wanted you to see how this uh, thickness planing process progresses so you have an idea what to look for when you're making next level millwork of your own. Well, after a few more passes, all the blades are the plain flat and smooth on the top. So for the final pass, to take them down another 30 second of an inch to the final thickness, I take all the pieces and flip them top for bottom and for end. And that sequence helps me make sure that both faces of all the pieces are played through the thickness planer because the finish I get out of that machine smoother and more consistent than what I get by passing these pieces over the joiner. And because I'm doing a whole batch in the same sequence, I'm confident that all the pieces are milled to perfection on both faces. To yield the next level middle gap finish and pieces that I'm after. One final pass at 1 32nd of an inch on the back faces of all these blanks is all that's needed to complete this noisy but vital step in milling these next level nickel gap blanks. Now the faces are complete after that final pass and it's time for the edges. And if you're working through milling a stack of blanks and you're at this stage, that's what it should sound like when you slap these pieces together because they're clean, flat, straight, and uniform. And any twist in the pieces will keep them from snapping like that, meaning that you've got a really stubborn piece of wood or their shortcomings in your milling process to get to this stage. But as I said, with the faces behind us, it's time for edges. And so it's back to the joiner where I'll clean up the best edge on each one of these pieces. And I'm just taking a whisker off of here because remember, some of these pieces are only five and three eighths of an inch wide. And if I take too heavy of a pass, I miss the mark and I got to back up and glue up and all that kind of stuff. So I've got the depth of cut set at a skinny 32nd of an inch, which is generally enough to square the edge to the face and make sure it's straight and true after all the thickness planing. And as usual, before doing a critical milling step like this, I double check the fence with an onboard square just to make sure I'm squaring up that edge because that'll be very critical in the steps that follow. And another note, because the edges that pass over this joiner are finished edges. I use a slow, steady feed rate because I want that helical cutter head to put a nice, smooth finish on the edge of these boards, even though very little of it shows in the finished millwork. It's a small thing, but an important thing because I hate sanding and I don't want to have to spend undue time sanding these edges because I got in a hurry with this joiner step. But this step for each of these pieces couldn't be quicker or easier. And now with the best edge of the board cleaned up, I've got the saw set to five and a quarter plus a strong 32nd of an inch. And I'll use that setting to rip the opposite edge of each one of these planks so that edges are straight, true, and parallel, and all the boards are the exact same width. After ripping that edge, I leave the depth of cut setting the same on the joiner 
and run the saw cut edge over the cutter head so that now both edges are cleaned up, the pieces parallel in width from end to end, and both edges are planed to a fine mill finish. And the piece is cleaned up perfectly at five and a quarter inches in width. I run each of these three steps sequentially on each one of the pieces as I go down through the stack, planing, ripping, and replaning so that when I'm finished with the second planing pass, the piece is done so I can place it in the perfect plank pile. Pow! Now here's a flyover of those 26 pieces, each a little over 5 feet long, and they're 52 edges that got three passes each for a total of 780 lineal feet of milling in about a half an hour's time to yield this pile of perfect paneling planks. Now that I'm past the point of planing all these pieces of paneling, I'll pause to present the prospect that you consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. Please? While you're at it, do me a solid and hit that thumbs up button and browse links in the video description for links to tools, supplies, and materials you'll see at use here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop on this and other videos here on the channel. I'm also proud to announce release of an official digital PDF plan set that shows in detail how to build a Grote tangent ramp outfeed roller stand like you see me using here in this video. Along with those detailed digital plans, Check out official Grote gear, like this cool die-cut sticker that's available through Spring, and this swanky t-shirt with Grote logo and graphics, custom designed by my good buddy Dan at Projects in Rapid City. I'm styling now, and you can too. Just check out links in the video description to Spring, and pick up some Grote logo gear, because hey, it's a great way to start the new year. Before I get back to making sawdust, I want to give a shout out to patrons who go above and beyond to support video production here on the channel. In appreciation for their patronage, I produce short videos on an almost weekly basis that gives patrons a look into behind the scenes stuff from here in the next little carpentry shop and out on the job site when I'm working for discerning clients on my day job, like the facelift and renovation that I'm doing that gets this nickel gap paneling. Observant viewers will notice this router lift installed in the table, and that's a brand new Powerlift Pro by MLCS. And patrons got to see a recent three-part series I did for unboxing that router lift and installing it in this table for use in the Next Level Carpentry Shop. So if that sort of content is something you're interested in, follow the link to Patreon in this video's description and get signed up for more of that behind-the-scenes content from the channel. Perhaps now I'll ponder the prospect to press on and prepare the panels you're patiently planning to produce. Good idea. With all these pieces planed to perfection, I'm at a crossroads in the project here because, as I mentioned early in the video, not all nickel gap is created equal. But with piles of prepared blanks, I can take different directions at this crossroads. And if I were going with just a square edge profile and a nickel gap, I could skip the next few steps. But because client and designer decided on a rounded edge profile here, I'm going to do that step next using an eighth inch roundover bit and a Bosch Colt router. And I've got the bit depth set so that that eighth inch radius comes perfectly tangent with the base of the router and that makes the roundover come perfectly tangent and flush with the face of the blanks as I go through this milling step. While I'm off subject and deep in the weeds, I'll mention that uh, if this was going to be just a square edge profile, I'd take a 150 grit sandpaper and knock off those sharp corners. But I'll also mention if you wanted a bevel, this could be done with a 45 degree bit like this. That would put kind of a standard V-groove pattern on the edges of the planks. Or I could even use a bit with a 15 degree bevel for another unique profile on the edges of this nickel gap paneling. And if hard pressed, I could probably come up with a couple more unique design ideas for the edges of these pieces. But for this project for now, I'm going to step off that rabbit trail and run this 8 inch roundover profile on the edges of all these pieces. And one final note is, as I go through the stack, I quickly flip the piece 
to pick out the show face and route the round over on the corners, which will leave any defects on the back of the pieces that will never be seen again once this paneling gets installed. Because the soft maple is actually kind of hard and highly figured, I'm using high RPM on the router and using a slow feed rate to keep the edges from chipping as I route off that razor sharp corner. And even though I was just bragging moments ago about the brand new MLCS Powerlift Pro router lift I now have installed in the next level carpentry shop, I still choose to do this operation handheld and with a small Bosch Colt router. I do this for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that it'll actually come out better and faster than using a router lift or a router table. 245, 246, 247, 248, 249, 250. Woohoo! 250 lineal feet of roundover routing on these 26 nickel gap paneling pieces in about 20 minutes time. Not bad. Not bad at all. And regardless what edge profile you choose for your nickel gap paneling, that's probably the single most fun and rewarding step of the whole project. But the next step isn't bad, and it's equally necessary. I'll switch from the thin kerf rip blade I use normally to a full 8 inch rip blade that has a flat top grind for making flat bottom grooves. Notice I use a blade stabilizer for cleaner grooves and a matching zero clearance insert for plowing the grooves in this step. Setup for this step is simple and straightforward. All I need to do is make an accurate mark one quarter inch from a sharp edge of my sample piece and set the blade height to that mark for a groove that will end up an eighth inch wide and exactly a quarter inch deep. And once I'm satisfied with the blade height, I lock it in place with the knob on the side. Next, I set the rip fence to exactly one quarter of an inch to leave that space between the fence and the blade for making this groove. And now to complete the setup and ensure accuracy and consistency, I add a feather board with light pressure to guide each piece as it passes the spinning blade to cut the groove. With everything set up for cutting those grooves, I stage all the pieces with the rounded over face or the finished face away from the fence so that these grooves end up in the same place on all the pieces. I do one edge, then flip the board end for end and do the other edge and that keeps everything consistent throughout the stack and because I've got everything staged the right way, I won't make a stupid mistake halfway through and run the face against the fence to create a frustrating situation. And as a quick overview, you remember these pieces are 5 eighths of an inch thick. I spaced the groove a quarter inch from the back of the piece. There's an eighth inch groove and that leaves a quarter inch from the groove to the face on all the pieces as well. And those dimensions can vary from project to project depending on the design, etc. Because I want the nickel gap gap to be a quarter inch deep. That's where I ended up. I can move the groove farther back and have more of a more depth in that reveal or closer to the front to make it a shallower shadow line between the pieces. But I made a prototype with this exact setup that the designer and client like. So that's how I got to the profile and dimensions you see here and now for this project. And now I can crawl out of yet another rabbit hole and get to work running these grooves with the dust processor on and the roller stand in place. And with that additional 250 feet of milling, I've got the groove part of the tongue and groove taken care of and can switch to tongue making mode next. It's plenty obvious by now that the main difference between this custom milled nickel gap paneling and what you buy in a store is that the tongue part of the tongue and groove on this has got to be a loose fitting spline rather than a tongue that's actually milled in. And there's a couple advantages to that difference because I can make these pieces out of narrower material because I don't need to have enough to hold that tongue on and I can do the milling and profiling with router bits and a table saw rather than a dedicated router bit and or shaper cutter. And because this paneling is going to get a painted finish rather than a stained finish, I can just use eighth inch masonite that will fit into that eighth inch slot and that spline will act like a tongue so that these nickel gap pieces fit together in traditional tongue and groove fashion. So all it really takes 
to make the tongues or the splines for these pieces is to rip 5 eighths of an inch wide strips off this eighth inch thick masonite material, which looks something like this, where I merely set the fence to 5 eighths of an inch and use a special dedicated professional carpenter's push stick to rip spline strips off this wider piece of eighth inch masonite. Just like that. And then those strips can be inserted into the grooves on the edges of the pieces. to get an excellent nickel gap effect with no more trouble than that. And granted, it takes a little bit of fussing to pre-paint those narrow strips before final installation of the nickel gap paneling. But I think you'll agree with me that that is a next level fit and finish for custom profile nickel gap paneling. In situations where the finished project needs to be stained or if your contractor doesn't have any eighth inch masonite that's long enough to make five foot strips in one piece, you can always take the fallback position of making splines out of the same wood that the paneling is made out of, which is the situation here. So I've taken useful offcuts from the sizing process and milled them down till they're exactly 5 eighths of an inch thick, which is exactly as thick as these little strips are wide, so that I can go about ripping strips like that off of strips like these on a saw like this. What's that you say? That terrible scratchy noise coming out of your speakers? Well, that right there is the sound of a microphone cable going bad. The few last strands of the wire in there, separating, separating, and then they break and the sound goes off. So it spoils the whole soundtrack that's been recorded as I'm working. And because I've already done the job, I can't go back and reshoot the sequence. So there's a section here of this video going forward to the end where there's some pretty lousy audio. But I just wanted to let you know that it's a little microphone wire, not your computer, not your device, not your phone, but a teeny little wire that hooks a microphone to a receiver in my pocket. And the bad news for me is that there's no indication on the camera or on the microphone that the cable's going bad. And I can only tell after the fact that there's a problem. And the bad news for you is that you have to put up with some very marginal audio between now and the end of the video. But please accept my apologies and bear with me because as you'll see, this nickel gap paneling came out a whole lot better than the audio track from the video. To minimize waste and maximize yield, I switched to yet another dedicated saw blade, which in this case is an ultra thin curve, six and a half inch diameter, 24 tooth CMT ripping blade because the teeth are sharp and the blade is thin. And notice the large diameter blade stable I'm using with this setup. Minimize vibration from such a thin blade in hardwood. Because the splines I'm cutting are also thin, change out the zero clearance insert and make a fresh cut through it with this skinny blade for smooth, consistent results while cutting these pieces. Now that I've got the ultra thin curve blade plunged through brand new zero clearance tabletop insert, I'm going to play my rough cut video card because when it's all set up to use my thin strip cutting fixture, and you can see the clips here where I got everything set up to cut these eight stitch strips and off cut to the waist side of the blade. But I just got frustrated using that process because it's not easy to reset the fence to the new board length after making each thin strip rip. And the strips I was getting were inconsistent enough that some of them were sloppy loose in the dado and the others wouldn't stick. So I needed to come up with a different method for getting this done because I do need 26 of these 8 inch by 5 8 inch by 5 feet long strips. And they need to be really consistent and I don't want to end up in ER by using an unsafe method. So I did like everybody else. I got on YouTube and surfed around for videos and came up with one that's actually really good by Inspire Woodcraft and I like the guy's style, his approach, and the results he's getting. But the only exception there is uh, that video and any of the others I checked out were only for short pieces um, and they were accomplished by making a jig the length of the short piece. And I didn't feel any of those were the practical solution for cutting strips five feet long because everything you gain, I think you'd lose in trying to make repetitive cuts of these thin strips. And so my fallback position is to just cut these strips in a conventional manner. And to make that possible, again, I'm relying on a very clean, very accurate zero clearance insert. And I have the capability of replacing the insert in the insert and getting that done. But you can make a dedicated insert plunge that thin blade up through it. 
The other thing I bring to the table, or the table saw, to make this happen is one of my professional carpenters push sticks like this, and this is an extended version of what I normally use. So the function is the same, but it has the added capability of being able to hold the workpiece farther ahead and push it smoothly through past the blade. And because, in my mind, all push sticks are sacrificial, I just cut a thin curve through the heel of this, making the first cut, and it works great for the remainder of the pieces. So I won't show you the clip where I had a slice of humble pie with my other setup, but I will bring the camera in close to show you how this works. And hopefully, the takeaway is that you can indeed cut rather long, very thin strips accurately and consistently with conventional methods, provided that you have a sharp blade, a true zero clearance insert, and proper setup of the fence and the table saw. As I rip each piece and pull them off the saw, I use a black sharpie marker to mark the cut edge of the blank and the cut face of the strip. so that I know which side is good and which side is bad on the strip when they finally get installed. And then I know to run this blank over the joiner again, taking about a 64th of an inch off to smooth up both edges of the blank before coming back to the saw and ripping off two more of these little strips. And with that set up, this sequence and this process, this is uh, working just great. And I've got these splines that slide into those eight inch slots. There's no trouble at all. And there's just enough room on there that they'll fit in there snug when these strips are painted. And so for me in the next level carpentry shop, the best thin strip ripping jig is no jig at all, but a sharp blade, an accurately set up table saw, and very importantly, a true zero clearance insert in the table. And there again, I generally, I never use a riving knife, but if you do use a riving knife, you might consider not using it in a setup like this because the saw blade is so close to the fence. And with a good push stick, your fingers aren't going to get near the blade, and it makes this whole setup possible and repeatable in my home opinion. And a sweet feature of using this sort of setup is that I can easily set the fence to the thickness of one of these masonite strips so I know that the wood strips I cut are going to be the same thickness and fit snugly but easily into the slots in my nickel gap handling feature. And now that everything is in place, set up and explain. It takes very little time to rip the stack of splines I need to create real wood tunnels for 26 pieces of nickel gap panel. And because I carefully rejoin both edges of each blank after ripping the strip off, the blank remains perfectly straight and square by removing the saw cut so that each of the splines is a smooth, plain face to be painted and a consistent thickness, smooth fit, easily through on the And if you like the way these professional push sticks perform on a next level operation like this, follow the link in the upper left hand corner of your video screen to show how I make these push sticks in case you're inclined to make some for use in your shop. And that ain't much for waste in my book. And then with that setup and that system, it doesn't take long to cut the 26 strips that I need, plus four or five extras to use the tongues and splines for the stack and nickel gap panel. And these strips are real good, fitting to the grooves and the paneling. This is good, it's not a little bit better than the strips of eighth inch masonite. Now I have to say, I'm pleased as punch with the fit of this next level nickel gap panel and think that this is definitely a product that I'm proud of and can stand behind once it's installed in my client's job. Now that I'm done talking about tongues, the next step for me is to separate these planks and spend a couple hours doing touch up sanding and preparation so that I can take all these pieces to my painter shop where he'll spray on a coat of primer and a couple coats of the finished color before they're delivered to the job site for installation. And so I'll wrap up by saying, as always, and until next time, thanks for stopping by next little carpentry. Thanks for watching.
Now if I can just get Chip to come by and do some of this sanding, I'll take that as a good start for the new year. I find it kind of hard to believe that anybody is still watching this video here at the end of the end of the end, what with all the audio and video trouble that I had in producing the video to this point and producing these nickel gap paneling planks that you saw in that video. But if anyone's still out there, first off, congratulations. And second off, I wanted to talk about one more step that I do to this paneling. And it's a good step, it's an important step, but I can't stand here and say that it's actually 100% necessary. So let me show you what I'm talking about. The stacks here are all the completed pieces and I have two of them out here to talk about this. And the main thing is that if you look at the, the end of the piece, the end profile, it's uh, 5 eighths of an inch thick, 5 and a quarter inches wide with the grooves on it and everything. That's all well and good, but a piece of wood like this, uh, especially solid wood, that uh, is probably just going to get painted on one face. It might get painted on the back to um, help balance the moisture movement in and out of the wood. But depending on the species of wood and where it gets installed, this piece still is uh, thick enough to have an opinion of its own. So the final step that I do is to run a back out profile and it changes it from this to this. And this uh, is what I use for a back out profile. And I hope this focuses. You can see it here. It's these two flat bottom V grooves with a space in the middle. And what that does is take uh, some of the strength or the opinion out of the piece because now it's reduced thickness. If it has a tendency to cup or whatever, the wood is weaker this way, but it's still plenty strong enough. There's no weakness here and it's not going to cause splitting. And so it's worth uh, doing the back out profile for that reason alone. And the other thing is, installing a, a perfectly flat board like this that's so stiff on a wall. If there's any bumps in the wall, the, it'll cause the piece to rock. It won't necessarily sit tight against the wall. And I don't want to just leave them flat like this and just put a bunch of construction adhesive on there and expect the paper on uh, the drywall to help hold it on. And so this double back out profile here is what I use so that I can sleep at night after the installation, not worry about the panels cupping and starting to look weird over time. And this back out could be run uh, with a dado blade on a table saw with multiple passes, but I just so happen to have a molder in the next level carpentry shop that does a real first rate professional job of this. And some next level carpentry viewers have seen this machine at work before, but I'll give you a quick overview of the setup for making these two back out groove passes. And here's my molder. Um, I've had this thing for 20 some years and it's a really simple straightforward machine. I don't talk about the brand or not a lot because it's a good product. But frankly, uh, the company can be a little bizarre to deal with. With that said, it's a great machine and the way I've got it set up is just with a couple of knives, the shape of that groove that you can see here mounted to the cutter head. There's just two knives, spins at a super high RPM. And these are super sharp, brand new back out knives. These are made of black nitride steel. And these are hot off the press or hot off the grinder from my buddy Tim Younger who sharpens and creates the knives that I use in this molder. So I'm really excited to use these because it's a really hard, long lasting steel. And of course, those are sharper than a Ginsu knife right now. And I'll give you a little treat with my fingers clear and everything else. I'm gonna fire up the molder and you can see those knives spin. They just turn into a blur when the molder is running. And that is a scary amputation device if there ever was one. But you can see it has powered in-feed and out-feed rollers that pull the pieces through. And if I were doing miles of this stuff, I would need four cutters, two here and two here. But as it is, I'm just running through and making one pass on one side. And then I just flip the piece side for side, which makes those back out grooves centered up in the piece. There's still plenty of thickness and material here at the edge so it doesn't weaken the groove or the tongue that goes in it but that's pretty much all there is to it. So let me close this up, fire everything up, and show you what it looks like with pieces of nickel gap paneling running through this molder. You might be surprised to learn that the noise from this molder is about half the decibels of my DW735 thickness planer, so it's not an unpleasant noise to deal with while working in the shop, but with the dust processor and the molder running, it's definitely too loud to talk with the machines running. 
So what you're seeing me do here is start the dust processor and run panels back side up, end to end, through the molder, cutting a groove first in one side, flipping the board, cutting the groove in the other side, etc. And after four passes, I've completed the back out profile on two of the nickel gap pieces. As the nickel gap planks with the finished back out profiles come out of the molder, you can see the Grote roller stand doing its job here by picking up those pieces and guiding them while I feed the next plank into the molder. And for a bit of end of the end trivia, I can tell you if you don't already know that making moldings with this molder is why I designed and built Grote tangent ramp outfeed roller stands in the first place over 20 years ago. And that really is all that there is to putting this double back out profile in this nickel gap paneling. And for my time and my money, it's well worth the extra effort to end up with a more stable finished product. That'll be easier to install and look better when it's installed. So I guess that's it for the end of the end of the end of this video at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of 2023. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking around.